Countless galaxies populate the universe, each with billions of stars majestically spread out over tens of thousands of light years. However, a surprising number of these galaxies in the outermost reaches of the universe are peculiar. They appear so bright, yet so compact, that their nature was a complete mystery. Most galaxies in the universe derive the light we see from stars. They're made out of stars. There is a peculiar collection of galaxies called active galaxies in which a large amount of light is produced by some strange and unknown process taking place in their centers. It's not definitely the light of stars, it's something else. From the moment the first strange object called a quasar was discovered, astronomers knew it was unlike any other object in the sky. It is so different from all the other things we see in the universe, which are stars and exploding stars and galaxies. A quasar is something so different from all these things that it's totally mysterious, and scientists love mystery. One of the mysterious things about them was that there were point sources. They appeared to the casual observer just like any other star in the sky. However, as telescopes improved and instrumentation improved, people started seeing that the quasars weren't exactly like stars. They didn't, they didn't have the same size and shape on the sky as stars did. Instead, they started to look a little bit fuzzy. Quasars were first discovered in the early 1960s by their radio emission, although most quasars are not strong radio emitters. At the position of these radio sources were stellar appearing objects, which, because we at that time knew that stars were not strong radio sources, these couldn't be normal stars, they were called quasi-stellar radio sources, which has since been shortened to quasar. One of the first quasars to be identified with a visible counterpart was 3C273. Its spectrum was also very different from that of a normal star. It was Martin Schmidt in 1963 who was first able to decode the spectrum of the quasar 3C273 and find that the features that were seen in the spectrum were in fact the well-known features of the Balmer spectrum of hydrogen, the most abundant in the element in the universe, but shifted by 15% towards the red. It, it, it came as an inspiration, essentially. Uh, there were, in total, five or six lines in the, in the spectrum of 3C273. Um, and one afternoon, when I was sitting at a desk, writing a manuscript about about the, the observations, I realized that among those six lines, if I forgot about two, that the others seemed to be regular in spacing and in intensity. For some reason, I started to make an energy level diagram on the basis of what I saw. I made a mistake in the arithmetic. I became slightly irritated and said to myself, but there is regularity there. In order to check that, I took the ratio of each of the lines I had under consideration to the Balmer lines of hydrogen, which after all are very regular. And suddenly it dawned upon me that this was a redshift of the Balmer spectrum itself. That was a shock. So, what Schmidt had found in the spectrum was a red shift that indicated the quasar was moving at a tremendous velocity, approximately 15% the speed of light. Now, the extraordinary thing was not the large red shift, because at that time there were already galaxies known with much larger red shifts. The extraordinary thing was the brightness of the quasar because it was several orders of magnitude brighter than even the brightest galaxy could appear at a distance of a billion light years. So it was not the large redshifts, but rather the tremendous luminosity which first pinpointed the quasars as extraordinary objects. 
Given that quasars were billions of light years away, astronomers were able to infer the luminosity or intrinsic brightness of these objects. The results were astounding. The luminosities inferred this way were perhaps a hundred times the luminosity of an entire galaxy. Now that would lead one to believe that perhaps these were simply scaled up versions of normal galaxies. On the other hand, when optical astronomers started to monitor the optical light from the galaxies, they noticed that they fluctuate very significantly. This is actually quite, um, quite useful in telling us something about what the source of the quasar light is. The idea is that if an object varies, the size of the object must be somehow correlated with the size of the variation. This gives us some very important clues that the quasar is actually extremely compact, very small. It's any physical mechanism which turns off or affects significantly the energy generation within an object can't propagate faster than the speed of light across that object. You can't turn a light bulb off any faster than it takes light to travel across the size of the bulb. So that implied that this luminosity, a hundred times the luminosity, perhaps a thousand times the luminosity of a normal galaxy, was all occurring from within the central one to two light months in size. That is a factor of 30,000 smaller than a normal galaxy. So we have in these very luminous quasars, the luminosity a thousand times the luminosity of an entire galaxy like the Milky Way consisting of hundreds of billions of stars but that luminosity is coming from a region which is smaller than the size of our own solar system. Of course something that bright coming out of an area that small it must be something extremely powerful and extremely weird. Not only that they're luminous in many different wavelength regimes. They're luminous in the radio, the infrared, the optical, ultraviolet, x-ray, we can study them in many, many different ways. We may have to reduce this data in the summer. Once astronomers knew that quasars emitted fantastic amounts of energy, they speculated that quasars were the cores of distant galaxies. But how could such immense power emanate from such tiny regions? The quasar turns out to be the extremely bright nucleus of a galaxy. What's going on there, we believe, is a central black hole with a rotating disk of material slowly falling into the black hole. We call it an accretion disk. And an enormous amount of energy radiated in that process. The model that we have right now is that a quasar consists of a very massive black hole sitting in the center of an otherwise more or less normal galaxy. We think that the very bright light that we see coming from the quasars actually comes from matter that is being swallowed by this black hole. So the question is, what keeps the quasars going? What keeps on fueling the monster in the center of this galaxy? One idea is that it's interactions between galaxies, that if the quasar is sitting in a galaxy here, and another galaxy flies by, these objects are going to interact gravitationally. The theories suggest that large amounts of gas and stars and other, other material flows between the galaxies and some of it will also be dumped into the center of the galaxy hosting the supermassive black hole. One good example of a quasar that might be fueled by interaction between galaxies is the quasar PG1613 plus 65. You can see that the quasar is surrounded by several other galaxies and it's clearly interacting with at least one of these other galaxies. We think that this interaction might be providing the quasar in the center of this object with enough fuel to keep it as bright as it is. Eventually, quasars do run low on fuel and change into more normal galaxies. Billions of years ago, quasars generated the light which is just now reaching us from their tremendous distances. There are no nearby quasars. They existed only in the past. Many people think that quasars may have formed as part of the 
normal formation process of normal galaxies and in the very early history of galaxies these quasars uh, lit up as a part of the galaxy formation process went through a brief period of perhaps a billion years or a few hundred million years in which this quasar shone very brightly and then either because of lack of fuel or some other reason this quasar gradually died out. If this hypothesis is correct, then there are lots of dead quasars around, and astronomers are actively looking for these dead quasars at this day. Between us and the distant quasars lie many other types of galaxies with active nuclei, similar to quasars, but visibly different. We're picking up the source about three hours east of the meridian, and we'll track it intermittently. Astronomers struggle to find the relationship between quasars from the past and these other, less distant, active galaxies. We subdivide the classes of active galaxies into um, several based principally on their spectra. Uh, the objects that we believe to be the most luminous in the universe and, and the ones which are the principal testers of all of our theories are quasars. There are nearer by and less luminous objects similar to the quasars. These are called Seifert galaxies. The Seifert galaxies are usually spiral galaxies with very compact and bright nuclei. They have broad, strong emission lines in the optical. They sometimes have some radio emission, but it's not outstanding. So it's the unusual nuclei, both in terms of brightness and in terms of the bizarre nature of the gas and presumably the stars near those nuclei that make them exceptional. Most quasars and Seifert galaxies are not strong emitters of radio waves, but there are powerful radio emitters among the quasars, and there are galaxies which are powerful radio emitters called radio galaxies. If you could have radio eyes, you'd be able to see galaxies very prominently. We don't do that, of course, in the optical. But some very prominent objects, like Cygnus uh, A was originally discovered, Centaurus A. These are the brightest radio sources in the directions of those constellations. You get a very different picture of galaxies looking at them in the optical versus looking at them in the radio. In the optical, the light is coming from stars. In the radio, the radio emission is not coming from the stars, but rather coming from high-energy particles, electrons which are spiraling in magnetic fields. Despite the appearance of a variety of active galaxies, such as quasars, Seiferts, and radio galaxies, it turns out they can be explained by a single unifying model. A, a very popular idea is that most classes of galaxies represent really the same physical phenomenon, but that our viewing angle determines the observational appearance of the object. One can identify several potential components in this uh, unified model of active galactic nuclei, quasars, and, and Seifert galaxies. The first component, the central object, is a supermassive black hole, uh, perhaps a hundred million or a billion solar masses, which is accreting material and transforming gravitational energy into other forms of energy, which we see. Surrounding the black hole is a disk of material, the so-called accretion disk, which is feeding the black hole and which comes from clouds of gas which strayed too close to the nucleus. The next component would be the so-called broad emission line region. This is a region wherein clouds of gas are ionized by the central source, which are moving around at velocities which are very large, thousands of kilometers per second and which produce the characteristic emission lines which we see in the quasars and in the broad emission line uh, galaxies. The next component would be a dusty molecular torus, which would be a few light years in size, which could, under certain, certain viewing angles, obscure the central region, the broad emission line region, the accretion disk, and the supermassive black hole. While the dusty torus can prevent us from observing the core of an active galaxy, astronomers have used inventive techniques to get a different angle of view. An extremely exciting result that we obtained observing, which ranks as one of the most exciting times or discoveries of my scientific career, is the study of an active galaxy, a Seifert galaxy, 
that has the catalog number NGC 1068. This was known to be an active galaxy of a certain type, but by using sophisticated techniques involving polarization measurements, the measure of polarized light, we found that lurking in the heart, invisible to ordinary light, was a much bigger monster than anybody knew. In fact, an object that was 100 times brighter than what we saw. From the direction we were looking, it was invisible, but we were able to find mirrors located in the galaxy, that is, dust clouds that acted like mirrors that reflected and allowed us to get a view of a totally hidden monster that was living completely obscured in the heart of this galaxy. Such observations into an otherwise hidden active nucleus confirm that the angle at which we view the galaxy determines whether we can see its intensely bright and tiny core. This is also true of radio galaxies where the activity in the core can generate radio emissions in regions extending far beyond the visible galaxy. In the case of the radio emission, what one often sees is a very concentrated, very high brightness radio source in the nucleus of the galaxy, probably confined to a light year or so in size. On the other hand, one also sees perhaps a million light years in size, a very extended radio emission, and that is perhaps a hundred times the optical extent of the galaxy. The radio lobes are like ears around the galaxy. The physical mechanism of radio emission isn't completely understood, but the most accepted idea here is that the basic energy source is gravitation, that is gravity converting potential energy of stuff falling in toward a massive central object, something like a black hole or a black hole in its accretion disk, and then some fraction of that being then ejected in two narrow cones or beams. These two radio structures are not independent very sensitive radio maps actually show evidence of continuous radio emission all the way from this very bright source in the nucleus out to the extended lobes. And that connecting radio emission often looks like a very thin trace along the sky. Radio galaxies, quasars, and other active galaxies are relics of cosmic evolution. As such, they give us a window to earlier epochs in the development of the universe.